Hello, and welcome to another episode of AmRev360, Conversations on the American Revolution from All Angles. I'm Scott Stevenson. I'm president and CEO of the Museum of the American Revolution here in Philadelphia. And I'm so excited today to be joined with my good friend, Denise Dennis, who's the president and CEO of the Dennis Farm Charitable Land Trust. And you are going to be fascinated to hear about the Dennis Farm, about Denise, her amazing personal story, her amazing family connections through American history, back to the American Revolution itself. And um, so thanks for joining us today for our uh, casual conversation. Denise, welcome. It's good to see you again, my friend. Thank you for having me, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here, even virtually. <laughs> for those who are watching today, uh, I'd just love to start with learning a little bit more about you, Denise. Where did you grow up? Um, what's your background? And what in the world is the Dennis Farm Charitable Land Trust? And what's your connection here? I can't talk about myself without talking about the Dennis Farm. I grew up in Wyoming Valley, Pennsylvania. Well, Wilkesboro is the county seat. There are, there's a very small African-American population. And when I grew up as the only African-American girl in my elementary school, but our family had been in the area for a very, very long time. And the farm, the Dennis farm is about 40 miles north and west of Wilkesboro. And my great, 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 great grandparents came to the region from Connecticut. That whole area was settled by Connecticut settlers because it was originally a part of the Connecticut colony, which is a very long story I will not go into here. <laughs> but anyway, my ancestors settled a farm in what is the Endless Mountains, as I said, north and west of Wilkesboro. And my great grandfather moved to the Wilkesboro area in 1886 when he was 20, but his brother continued to keep the farm. And his brother um, died in 1918. And about 20 years after he died, they turned it into a summer home. And um, even into my childhood and in the 60s, so I even spent time there in the summers. And so, um, and I knew that one of our ancestors, two people in our family were in the revolution, were buried in the family cemetery. And I knew another one of our relatives was killed in what is known as Wyoming Massacre in Wyoming Valley. By the way, people, the state of Wyoming takes its name from Wyoming Valley, Pennsylvania. But that's another long story I won't go into. <laughs> So I just grew up, American history was a part of my personal history. So you sort of grew up with this, um, I imagine if when you were a school child and you're reading these stories of the, the, the revolution, there may perhaps Crispus Attucks or there may have been, uh, there may have been an African American character here or there. Um, uh, certainly not the way we would aspire for history to be taught today, but I'm just curious about, I, I suspect your your feelings of personal, sort of specific personal connection must have been um, uh, quite rich and, and vivid to you. Well, you know, when I was younger, I didn't know about the exclusionary aspect of it. So mm. I just kind of knew about my family. Yeah, I remember reading about Christmas addicts, but I didn't realize that it was rare that not a lot of what was known about African-Americans was known. I just knew we weren't George Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, we weren't Thomas Jefferson. We weren't famous. I just figured nobody would know about what we did because we're just regular people. Mm -hmm. It was later that I realized that, you know, the, we had one book on the family collection written in 1888. It was on um, Negroes, Negroes, the vernacular of the time, in the American Revolution and the Civil War. So yeah, we had a book, so it was chronicle. So on the one hand, it just seemed ordinary to me, not extraordinary. But in regard to how it made me feel about myself, I wouldn't have articulated it this way at the time. But of course, it gave me a lot of confidence. Mm. And I really felt a part of this country. Mm. Plus, I could stand on the land 
that they'd settled. So, but it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized what a gift it had been in my own life. I mean, I felt a part of the region I was from, felt a part of this country. I never felt that I didn't belong anywhere. Mm. But it wasn't conscious, it was just inside me. Mm. I'd love to uh, talk a little bit about the object that's just right over my shoulder here in the case behind me. Of course, we're broadcasting. I'm, I'm sitting uh, in the Oneida Indian Nation Gallery here in the core of our um, uh, exhibit here at the museum. And this is an area where we talk about uh, the involvement of Native Americans, specifically uh, the Oneida Indian Nation, connected to the fighting in the area where your ancestors were, the Wyoming Valley, and um, this is, of course, an engraved powder horn. This is made from a, from a cow's horn, which was um, a very light, um, water-resistant material that was used um, kind of like plastic is today for, as a container where you had to keep water away from things. Well, gunpowder is something. If you've heard the phrase, keep your powder dry, of course, that comes from keeping your gunpowder dry. And there's a wonderful um, uh, flourishing folk art tradition that starts in the mid uh, 18th century in New England of artistic carving of these of these powder horns this so-called so golden age of the uh, of the powder horn and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the one that's over my shoulder here and its connection to to your family you can see me smiling because as I've told you before again this was just something that was part of family life and now it's in your museum um, <laughs> Gershon Prince was a soldier in the revolution. He was an aide to Captain Robert Durkee, who was from the Connecticut colony and lived in Wyoming Valley. The Durkee brothers, John and Robert Durkee, kind of founded the fort, became the town of Wilkesburg. And um, the area of Wyoming Valley was supplying foodstuffs to Washington down in, down in the Philadelphia and Valley Forge. And for this reason, it became the British had their sights on it because they wanted to stop. The Wyoming Valley was very fertile for, for growing crops. And so they thought if they could stop this supply of food to Washington's army, this would be great. So the overwhelming force of 900 British troops, again, combined with Native Americans and Tories against 300 Valley people who were basically very young men and very old men the only men left turned out to be what was called the Wyoming Massacre because it took place in Wyoming, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were, they were slaughtered and they're buried in a common grave. Well, Gershon Prince was the uncle of my great, 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 great grandfather, Prince Perkins. Mm -hmm. And the powder horn they took from his body ended up in the possession of Prince, the one who founded the farm. And it ended up over the years in the hands of my great aunt, Edith Dennis. And she gave it to the Wyoming Historical Society in Wilkesboro. Wyoming Historical Society turned into the Luzerne County Historical Society from whence the Museum of the American Revolution acquired it for the moment at least. Right, so it's been a, a, a loan from the Luzerne County Historical Society. And it's been wonderful that they've been able to share this incredible object and they're carved on it of course this uh, Gershom Prince served in the French and Indian War uh, you know lost his life in the fight for American independence and, and also he identifies himself Gershom Prince is horn and he says um, uh, Negro Negro is horn yes. so he's he's saying who he is and then there are these scenes of everyday life of little cabins there's a little sign a post with a sign on it. It's just exquisite. Mm -hmm. It's the only object taken from an African-American soldier who died in battle, I think. <laughs> to think that over a million people have seen it and that it has such, it resonates for so many people mm -hmm. and helps to correct the story of America and our origins by being able to not only tell people or have written that an African-American man gave his life in the revolution, but to have something that he created himself and had on his person when he sacrificed his life. It's still, for me, it's hard to believe. 
that Hiroshima's horn is in the museum. So I'd love to I'd love to set maybe bring it to the Dennis Farm itself and talk a little bit about um, your vision, your great aunt, you know, sort of how this piece of land which ties back to the 18th century in continuous ownership from an African American family uh, with a connection to the revolution, uh, how this became the Dennis Farm Charitable Land Trust and what the sort of mission and activities of the Dennis Farm um, is today. Well, as I was telling you earlier, my great aunt Edith Angeline Dennis, named after her, gran her, her grandmother, Angeline Perkins Dennis, she kind of modernized the farm from 1939 to 1940 so that her father who was born there in 1866 could spend his remaining summers there. And the family did, he died before I was born, he died in 1950, but the family continued to go to the farm into my adolescence about. Mm. And then she just didn't want to do anything with it. <laughs> and she didn't want anyone else to do anything with it, but she also didn't want it to go out of the family. And um, so when she died in 1980, she left it to the youngest sibling, her sister Hope. And Hope was kind of the same. She paid the taxes every year, but they didn't want anybody. People would offer to buy it. The house was a four bedroom house, really beautiful house. And it's 153 acres. And as I said, Prince Perkins bought it with his Revolutionary War money. And then before Hope died, Hope was born in 1906. And around 1998, she asked me whether I had any ideas of what we could do with the farm. And she said, and I quote, I don't want it to go out of the family on my watch. Mm. Well, at one point I'd worked for Graduate School of Fine Arts at Penn, which is now the design school. And one of the departments was historic preservation. And I'd worked for them in the 80s. And in the back of my mind was maybe the farmhouse, I knew that any structure over 50 years old was you know, of historic value. So I thought maybe we can restore the house. I'm going to edit myself because you know me, I'll give you details that you don't need. To make a long story short is we received a grant through the Endless Mountains Heritage Region, we received a grant from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources in Pennsylvania, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We had a feasibility study done. And with a brilliant person, whom you know very well, Wade Katz, worked on our feasibility study. Yep. And he went up to the farm and he said, Denise, this whole property is of a historic value. Because my ancestors built these New England style stone walls on the property. The the cemetery is enclosed by stone walls and wrought iron gate. Our Revolutionary War vets, War of 1812 vet, my great, great, great grandfather, and a Civil War vet who was a black man who lived in that region. They were buried in the cemetery. Local history says it was a stop on the Underground Railroad. So Wade said the entire property. So the feasibility study was just fantastic. So. We set up the trust and, you know, we just, and the other thing that makes our background rare is everything is documented. Even the Susquehanna County Historical Society. When I, in the eighties, I had sent for whatever they had and they sent me a whole pile of things. So everything is documented. I've done research in Connecticut. I've been up to Concord. Um, we're in the, they have it, the, um, it's called, there are all these records they did of all the towns, county, town records in Massachusetts were in those. So we're fully documented. Otherwise, nobody would believe this. I don't think I would believe it half the time. <laughs> you know, um, I'd heard that we, our great, great, my great, great, great grandfather was in the War of 1812. So I did the research and sure enough, he was a teamster in the War of 1812, recruited by Thaddeus Stevens, of all people. But okay. anyway, with all the documentation, the land, the house is now in disrepair and we received a grant, as you know, because you were there when it was announced, mm -hmm. we received a $400,000 matching grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to help us transform the farmhouse to a museum. So if any of you want to send, you know, any contributions, just- This is a, this is a uh, uh, private nonprofit tr trust, right? So- Yes, it's an uh, 501c3 yep. and just go to the Dennis Farm dot org 
and you'll see something there that says donate and you can learn all about it. Denise, uh, as we talk about um, the, the value of reaching back into the past, you know, reflecting on the, all the generations that have brought us to where we are today. I'm just curious, you know, your sort of final thoughts about uh, when you look back on the work that you've done uh, preserving the Dennis Farm, the work with the, the contemporary work that you're doing uh, with the forum. Um, as we look forward, we're on the eve of celebrating the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and the, the launch of this uh, ongoing experiment in liberty, equality, and self-government. I just, uh, you know, what are your thoughts, your hopes for that, uh, for that moment that's, uh, that's approaching? Well, again, it's always hard for me to separate what is historically significant from what is personal. It sounds silly, but it's true. Having gone to the farm as a child, I mean, there's a picture of me as like a, an 18 month old in a hammock on the lawn with an umbrella over me. <laughs> to have something in, is personal, have such significance. I'm constantly humbled and I'm extremely grateful to those who came before me that they kept objects, that they passed the story on, that they told us the story, that they showed us our names in local history books. Norman Dennis was my grandfather, actually was brought up by my Dennis grandparents. He taught me all of this. And I think of him all the time. This is his project. He loved the farm. He knew the history. He taught me about Prince Perkins and also my Aunt Edith. The other thing, and I say this, when I was a child at the farm and daddy would say, this is where they first lived. And I remember when he took me to the cemetery, I had this image of all of us holding hands, standing side by side across the centuries, holding hand in this, hands in this long line. And I was just one little link in a long, long line. And that's a really, it's not a diminishing feeling, it's just a great feeling, that feeling of connection. So I see what I'm doing with the farm as just what I'm here to do. And now I'm just trying to make it available to not just our family to pass down, but for posterity. Sounds grandiose, but I mean it in a humble way. Um, so I just feel that it was given to me and that I'm just living up to my responsibility and how wonderful that it has resonance beyond just my family. I mean, African-Americans love hearing about this, but also we've had people of every race come to the farm. It enriches everybody. Mm. Everybody, they're surprised. It changes their perceptions. And hopefully it will bring us together to know that this African-American family had an atypical African-American experience, one to which we all aspire to own a little bit of land, be able to take care of our families, to educate the generations that come and to embark and be a part of the American dream. You know, we're not famous, but we did our part. Denise Dennis, you're a national treasure. That's all, uh, I'll, leave it, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Oh my goodness, Scott, and, it's uh, always so great to see you. Well, be well and we'll, we'll talk soon.